Hey everybody, Spooky Marshmallow here, and today I am doing another podcast style video on the Bermuda Triangle. So, this one's going to take a while because there is a lot of information about the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, so, go ahead and grab a snack, grab your favorite drink, get cozy and comfy, and let's begin, shall we? Um, okay, so the Bermuda Triangle is also known as the Devil's Triangle. Uh, and it is a triangle that extends from Bermuda to Florida to Puerto Rico. And, okay, some people say that it is nothing more than urban legend. However, I say it's real. Um, I have always believed it's real since I first heard about it when I was a kid. I've believed in the Bermuda Triangle. Um, exactly what it is, though, for me, that's the mystery. I know it exists, but I don't know how it exists. So let's dive into um, some different areas and some different things and um, we'll see if we can figure this out. Um, so the earliest report from of the Bermuda Triangle, uh, it happened in 1950, um, September 17th. Oh, that's interesting. My birthday is September 12th, huh? Um, and it was published in an article from the Miami Herald by an Edward Van Winkle Jones. Uh, a few years later, Fate Magazine published uh, an article called Sea Mystery at Our Back Door. Um, and then there was uh, several articles about uh, missing planes and ships, including the loss of Flight 19. Um, which was a group of five U.S. Navy gunmen. Um, they were on a training mission and they disappeared. Um, that article, uh, which was written by George Sand, uh, was the first to lay out the triangle area where all of these losses have been known to take place. Um, so in February of 1964, a Vincent Gaddis wrote an article called The Deadly Bermuda Triangle. Uh, and this mag this article went to um, a... Uh, so a bunch of other writers uh, throughout the years have also uh, submitted uh, articles uh, talking about the Bermuda Triangle as well and all of the missing uh, boats and planes and all that area. Uh, all that area. All that stuff. <laughs> Sorry. I was looking down at my notes and I read area and said it. Um, so... Anyway, sorry, I uh, had to go on pause and had to go do something real quick. And now I'm out of breath because I ran up and down stairs. So, and I'm out of shape. So, <laughs> um, let's talk about um, criticisms of the idea that this truly does exist. So, a gentleman by the name of Larry Koosh, and I hope I am saying that right. Uh, he is the author of The Bermuda Triangle Mystery Solved. Uh, this came out in 1975. Uh, he argued that many of the claims were exaggerated um, and that he felt that his research revealed a number of inaccuracies and inconsistencies of those accounts and statements from eyewitnesses, participants, and others involved in the initial incidents. Um, Cush also noted cases where uh, pertinent information went unreported, such as the disappearance of round-the-world yachtsman Donald Crowhurst. 
um, which was a, a big mystery. Um, another example was an ore carrier um, that was lost without a trace three days out of an Atlantic port when it had been lost three days um, out of port with the same name in the Pacific Ocean. So that's interesting right there. Um, and that's something that um, I didn't know about until I started doing more research about this. Uh, so this boat went missing uh, not only out of, uh, it's just a small little ore carrier. Uh, not only did it go missing out of the Atlantic, but it went missing out of the Pacific as well. And that's what he was trying to say was that um, just because it, it went missing out of the Atlantic, you know, uh, it also went missing out of the Pacific. So how could it be missing, you know, out of both and the... Uh, just because it went missing out of the Atlantic, I guess is what I'm trying to say, uh, it could be as a result of bad record keeping, which I'm sure back in in those days, which would have been in the 50s and 60s, in between that area, uh, I'm sure that record keeping may not have been exactly precise as it is today. Um... And there's just other uh, events. Uh, it could have been, you know, he was trying to say it could have been unusual weather that were that was never mentioned in the disappearance stories. Um, so basically, he's trying to just say that the reports uh, are missing some things and they're exaggerated and uh, may simply even just not be true at all. Um, and there's a number of skeptics out there too, not just this guy, but this guy was the first one to speak up and say, Hey, I call BS on this whole thing. Um, he was just the first one, but there's many, many more, uh, people that believe that this is nothing, that this is just uh, poor record keeping. Um, There's other people, such as a gentleman named John Simmons, who in 1992 claims that a lot of the um, ships that were said to have sunk in the Bermuda Triangle or went missing in the Bermuda Triangle uh, actually did not go missing at all. Um, he just feels that it's... Uh, there's so there are so many so much um, aircraft and ships that go through that area on a daily basis that he felt that once again it may have just been poor record keeping or some sort of misunderstanding, um, you know, people getting their wires crossed or people just making up the stories, you know, for good urban legend sake. Um, he's him and. Uh, like I said, this goes to some, you know, some other people, coast guards, um, that kind of work in that general area, claim the same thing, that there is no, or, you know, it's not what people are saying that it is, and it's just made up urban legend type stuff, um, and that there, yes, there may be ships and, uh, aircraft that have, sank in that area but they sink no matter where you know it's not just one particular spot that they're going to sink I mean if they're going to sink they're going to do it everywhere you know what I mean I don't know if I if I'm getting a, across what I'm trying to say uh but just because it sinks you know it's not that doesn't mean it's you know a uh, paranormal type thing um, it can happen anywhere, I guess is what I'm trying to say to sum it up. It can happen anywhere. Uh, and the ocean's a very uh, wide open space. So I'm sure that there's plenty of sunken boats and aircraft in the ocean. I'm sure of it. And, and like 
some of the other skeptics say as well, too, that, you know, it could be, once again, just um, not only d bad record keeping, but maybe they had an equipment malfunction. It happens. Um, and that's why they were deemed lost at sea, just because they have, you know, um, technical difficulties and they couldn't get to anyone. Um, they couldn't respond. You know, their equipment stopped working. I mean, it happens, especially back then. I'm sure it happened way more often back then than it, it would in recent times. I'm, I'm sure. Um, they believe that the legend of the Bermuda Triangle is a manufactured mystery perpetrated by writers who either purposely or unknowingly made use of misconceptions, faulty reasoning, and sensationalism. Uh, and that is what a lot of people think. Um, even to this day, um, they just think it's a big hoax. In a 2013 study, the Worldwide Fund for Nature identified the world's 10 most dangerous waters for shipping, but the Bermuda Triangle was not among them. Very interesting. Could it be because they feel that the Bermuda Triangle is not a thing? I mean, I just want to know, I guess what I'm trying to say is, where's the evidence that this exists? Um, that would be my thing. But like I said, I'm not a skeptic. I believe it really does exist. Um, but I also believe in UFOs. So, hey, you know, it's, does it or doesn't it? But I, I'm just curious to know, you know, I also am curious to know what started it. You know, what, what made someone suddenly say, hey, I want to write this story and I am going to talk about missing aircraft and a bunch of missing ships all within this area. And why that area? Why did you pick that triangle between Bermuda, Florida, and Puerto Rico? Why that area? I'm just curious to know. You know, that's just one of those things that, you know, that that's where my mind goes. I'm like, what made that guy decide to write that article? Because aircraft and ships go missing every single day. So, and especially back then, I'm sure, uh, more frequently than today. Maybe not so much today, but back then, you know, um, before technology advanced like it has what made him suddenly do that? Was he bored? Like, was he this, you know, was he a reporter that needed a good article or he was going to lose his job? I'm just curious how, like, how that came about. What made him suddenly decide to write that article? So let's talk about some paranormal explanations of the Bermuda Triangle. Ooh, the word paranormal. One of my favorite words. Um, so... I'm just going to read, uh, and this is an excerpt from Wikipedia about this topic. And so I just want to read it because there's, there's a lot of juicy tidbits in this and I don't want to miss anything. Uh, so I'm just going to read it. So here we go. So triangle writers have used a number of supernatural concepts to explain the events. One explanation pins the blame on leftover technology from the mythical lost continent of Atlantis. <gasps> Ooh, now that is a big juicy tidbit right there, folks. Atlantis. You know, I could do a whole um, video about Atlantis um, because I find it so fascinating. Um, it's one of those things that... It's kind of like mythology and the Bible, like you read it and, and when you're reading information about it in your mind, you picture it and it's just something huge and grand and, and such on a huge scale that you just, you can't imagine all of it, but the tragedies of it, it's just, it's intriguing, I feel, um, that's good. You know, I, uh, I think I will. I think I'm going to do a, a video about the mystery of Atlantis. Um, 
that's got me thinking now um, and how it's related to that area. Um, you know, could the triangle have been around for so long that it actually did suck up Atlantis? Hmm, very interesting. All right, back to the back to the article. Sometimes connected to the Atlantis story is the submerged rock formation known as the Bimini Road off the island of Bimini in the Bahamas, which is in the triangle by some definitions. Followers of the purported psychic Edgar Cayce take his prediction that evidence of Atlantis would be found in 1968 as referring to the discovery of Bimini Road. Believers describe the formation as a road, wall, or other structure, but the Bimini Road is of natural origin. How interesting is that? Bimini Road. Now, I have never heard of that before, and that is extremely interesting. Um, I'm definitely going to look into that. Definitely. How cool. Okay, back to the article. Some hip hypothesize that a parallel universe exists in the Bermuda Triangle region, causing a time and space warp that sucks the objects around it into a parallel universe. Others attribute the events to UFOs. Charles Berlitz, author of various books on anonymous phenomena, lists several theories attributing the losses in the triangle to anomalous or unexplained forces. And that's interesting because that's what I have always been told. Even in school, I was told that that's what the Bermuda Triangle is, that it's an actual parallel universe. And when you enter it, it causes a time and space warp that projects anything that's in it into another dimension. That's what I have always believed. Now, the, the theory that they say that it's possible that it could be um, UFOs let's talk about that for a minute um because i have thought that at one time too that it was something um alien related like it would transport you to another alien world i guess that's where you know you could say a parallel universe and that the two are related parallel universe and you know um aliens uh are related um I think that's, that is interesting. I think that's, uh, that is an option, uh, for belief. I do feel, um, unexplained forces. Yeah. Is it a black hole? I've heard that it's a black hole as well, you know, underneath the water or speaking of that, is it a, a portal to, um, the upside down? Uh, my fellow stranger things fans will get that. Um, so let's move on. So let's talk about, um, natural explanations. Hang on a second. I need to take another drink. All right. And I am drinking vanilla diet Coke, uh, fountain, by the way, one of my favorite drinks, especially in the summertime. Love it. Tastes so good. And I'm trying to come off my caffeine addiction, but I have a feeling that doing these podcasts are going to make it worse because when I'm, when I want to relax and I'm talking about something that I love, that's the first thing I go to is a refreshing drink that I love and yeah, pop and anything with caffeine is, except for caffeine drinks like Monster and all them. I cannot do those, but, and I don't like Mountain Dew, but like mostly Diet Coke is my thing and teas. Um, sometimes, like in the fall and winter time though, I crave coffee. I love it. Okay, anyway, back to this. So, um, compass problems are one of the, um, cited phrases in many of the triangle incidents. Um, it, people say that. Or, well, they theorized that unusual local magnetic anomalies have existed in that area, but they had no proof of it. Um, compasses have natural magnetic variations in relation to magnetic poles, a fact which navigators have known for centuries. Um, 
magnetic compasses and geographic or magnetic compass north and geographic north are exactly the same only for a small number of places. Uh, for example, as of 2000 in the United States, only those places on a line running from Wisconsin to the Gulf of Mexico. That's interesting. But the public may not be as informed and think there is something mysterious about a compass changing across an area as large as the triangle, which is naturally its will. Um, that's something else that they just talked about in Stranger Things. So that's pretty cool. Um, so basically it's saying that your compass can change. The magnetic poles can change. And so, you know, they're trying to theorize that the reason that that the compasses for the navigators were off was because the magnetic pull had changed. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know much about that kind of thing. Um, but I find that very fascinating, actually. And I'm wondering if the magnetic poles changed in, in that area due to water current. You know, that that raises a question for me does the change of the water current could that possibly change magnetic poles making the compass change or go crazy sometimes even hmm, very interesting um so i'm gonna read on in part of this wikipedia um because i think this part is is also very important so the Gulf Stream is a major surface current, primarily driven by thermal line circulation that originates in the Gulf of Mexico and then flows through the Straits of Florida into the North Atlantic. So in essence, it is a river with an ocean and like a river, it can, it can and does carry floating objects. It has a maximum surface velocity of about two meters. A small plane making a water landing or a boat having engine trouble can be carried away from its reported position by the current. Very interesting. Um, and so one of the most cited explanations in official inquiries of the missing aircraft or vessel is human error. Um, and that's like what we've been saying like this whole time, like, or what I've been saying at least is probably a lot of it is actually um, bad re records taking. Um, that's just what I believe um, that it's, it's mostly just, you know, human error um, violent weather is another thing that they claim may be a big uh, problem in that area um, because of its locations you know you're going to get hurricanes and um, you know water what are they called water scrolls or whatever when there's like a little small storm in the ocean enough to you know rock your boat and possibly flip it over I mean any of that bad weather could happen in that area I mean it can happen anywhere in the ocean um, but maybe it was possible that when those the missing aircraft and the missing uh, ships went down or went missing was because at that time it was hurricane season and there was a storm brewing and a storm knocked them out, you know, um, that, that's a very big possibility, actually. Um, so this is something that I found when I was doing research that I thought was interesting, uh, that I had never heard this theory before, and I'm not too familiar with it. So I'm just going to um, read to you what Wikipedia said about it uh, because I don't know much about it. And that is methane hydrates. So an explanation for some of the disappearances has focused on the presence of large fields of methane hydrates, which is a form of natural gas on the continental shelves. 
Laboratory experiments carried out in Australia have proven that bubbles can indeed sink a scale model ship by decreasing the density of the water. Any wreckage can consequently rising to the surface would be rapidly dispersed by the Gulf Stream. It has been hypothesized that periodic methane eruptions, sometimes called mud volcanoes, may produce regions of frothy water that are no longer capable of providing adequate buoyancy for ships. If this were the case, such an area forming around a ship could cause it to sink very rapidly and without warning. Whoa. Okay, that is a huge eye-opener for me, you guys. Um, that... Wow, that just kind of blew the whole urban legend thing out of the water. No pun intended. Um, wow, I mean, that's, that's a big thing. Like, that very well could be what the, that area, what that triangle really is. It's full of those mud volcanoes. Um, and, you know, the navigators and captains, what have you, are just unable to get help fast enough. But hold on, that would not explain the aircraft that have gone missing in the triangle. So, okay, so I was excited, but now I'm not so excited because now I'm thinking about that. Those little mud volcanoes could explain the ships going down, but not the aircraft. Hmm. All right, so some notable uh, incidents that have happened in uh, the Triangle, and I'm just going to briefly, you know, go over some of these is the HMS Atlanta. Uh, this was a sail training ship. Um, she disappeared with her entire crew after setting set sail from the Royal Naval Dockyard in Bermuda for Falmouth, England on in January of 1880. It was presumed that she sank in a powerful storm. So... Um, Okay, I'm going to I'm going to stop right there and 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 think about this for a minute. So, how would they know that she sank in a storm? Um, oh man. Uh, sorry about that. I lost my screen for a minute. Um, how would they know that because they didn't have, you know, radios back then to communicate with other people. I mean, maybe they just assumed that that is what is what had happened. Um, the search for evidence of her fate attracted a worldwide attention at the time, uh, which foundered after departing the Royal Naval Royal Naval Dockyard in Bermuda, uh, and she was alleged decades later to have been a victim of the mysterious triangle. Um, so apparently they made research efforts to find the ship, but they, they never found her. So they just said, hey, she's just part of this mystery triangle. But that goes back to the volcano theory. Because if she got caught up in one of those mud volcanoes, it could have took her down very quickly. And it would have just destroyed the ship and the people, obviously. So, that's very interesting. Okay, next up is the USS Cyclops. Uh, I'm picturing like this big boat with an eyeball at the front. Uh, the incident resulting in the single largest loss of life in the history of the United States Navy not related to combat was the Cyclops. Carrying a full load of manganese ore. I think I said that right. Or is it? Mag yeah. Uh, whatever. And with one engine out of action, went missing without a trace with a crew of 309 people in March of 1918 after departing the island of Barbados. Um, 
Although there is no strong evidence for any single theory, many independent theories exist. Some blaming storms, capsizing, uh, wartime enemy activity. Um, two of Cyclops' sister ships, the Proteus and Nereus, were subsequently lost in the North Atlantic during World War II. Both ships were transporting heavy loads of metallic ore similar to that which loaded on, or which was loaded on Cyclops during her fatal voyage. In all three cases, structural failure due to overloading with a much denser cargo than designed is considered the most likely cause of sinking. I would agree with that. I would agree with that theory. Uh, Carol A. Deering is a five-masted schooner built in 1919, was found uh, hard aground and abandoned at Diamond Shoals near Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, in January of 1921. FBI investigation into the Deering uh, scrutinized then ruled out multiple theories as to why and how the ship was abandoned, including piracy, domestic communist sabotage, and the involvement of rum, rum runners. I call rum runners 1921, um, or I'm sorry, 1919 through 1921, I call rum runners on that one. Uh, Flight 19, um, and this one's one of the most popular uh, boats that went missing. Uh, it was a training flight of five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers that disappeared on December 5th, 1945, while over the Atlantic. The, the squadron's flight plan was scheduled to take them due east from Fort Lauderdale for 141 miles, uh, north for 73 miles, and then back over a final 140 mile leg to complete the exercise. The flight never returned to base. The disappearance was attributed by Navy investigators to navigational error leading to the aircraft running out of fuel. One of the search and rescue aircraft deployed to look for them, a PBM Mariner with a 13-man crew also disappeared. A tanker off of the coast of Florida reported seeing an explosion and observing a widespread oil slick when fruitlessly searching for survivors. The weather was becoming stormy by the end of the incident. According to sources, the Mariner had a history of explosions due to vapor leaks when heavily loaded with fuel, as it might have been for potentially long search and rescue operations. There you go. That's what happened. Um, so it goes down. Flight 19 goes down. And then the, um, the other plane, the PBM Mariner, um, goes, or no, I'm sorry, that wasn't the Mariner. The Mariner was the tanker. But anyway, the, so the other plane that uh, goes to look for them, it goes down, but that plane was defective in the first place. So that raises another question. Why would you load up a plane you know might possibly catch fire to go on a search and rescue in mission like <laughs> what the heck what sense does that make but whatever okay so uh let's move on so star tiger and star aerial uh these are both um aircraft um in 1949 on a flight from bermuda to jamaica um, they were passenger aircraft operated by a british south american airways both planes were operating at the very limits of their range and the slightest error or fault in equipment could keep them from reaching this small island. There you have it, folks. Uh, so they're flying but barely. So any little small thing happened, they're going down. And that's probably what happened. And then they got ate up by one of the mud volcanoes in the water. The Douglas DC-3. On December 28, 1948, Douglas DC-3 aircraft number NC-16002 disappeared while on a flight from San Juan, Puerto Rico to Miami. No trace of the aircraft or the 32 people on board was ever found. A Civil Aero Aeronautics Board investigation found that there was insufficient information available 
on which to determine probable cause of the disappearance. That one's interesting. Um, so, um, it's going from Puerto Rico, wait, right? From San Juan, yeah. From, so it's going from San Juan up to Miami. So this stretch right here is where it's going. And it goes down. And it's a big mystery. But it depends. If it, it was a small um, aircraft, maybe it got caught in bad weather. It didn't, it's not listed there um, on you know, what the theory was on why it went down, but, um, I don't know. That's, that's interesting. The Douglas DC-3, hmm, it had 32 people on board, so it was not a small aircraft. Insufficient information, hmm, that's interesting. Very interesting. Okay, moving on. Well, first I need to take a drink. My throat's getting sore. Okay, so the next one is Connemara, which was a yacht. Um, it was found adrift in the Atlantic south of Bermuda in September of 1955. It is usually stated in the stories that the crew vanished while the yacht survived being at sea during three hurricanes. The 1955 Atlantic hurricane season shows hurricane ion force. In his second book on the Bermuda Triangle, a gentleman named uh, Weiner Berlitz quoted from a letter he had received from J.E. Challoner of Barbados. This is what the letter says. On the morning of September 22nd, Connemara was lying to a heavy mooring in the open roadstead of um, Carlisle Bay. Because of the approaching hurricane, the owner strengthened the mooring ropes and put out two additional anchors. There was little else he could do as the exposed mooring was the only available anchorage. In Carlisle Bay, the sea in the wake of Hurricane Janet was awe-inspiring and dangerous. The owner of Connemara observed that she had disappeared. An investigation revealed that she had dragged her moorings and gone to sea. Um, so that's blamed on Hurricane Janet for that disappearance. Um, and I believe that, that story. I do believe that that, that could happen, yes. Uh, KC-135 Stratotankers. <clears throat> so sorry for that. So on August 28, 1963, a pair of U.S. Force KC-135 Stratotanker aircraft collided and crashed into the Atlantic 300 miles west of Bermuda. Some writers say that while the two aircraft did collide, there were two distinct crash sites separated by over 160 miles of water. However, Research showed that the unclassified version of the Air Force investigation report revealed that the debris field defining the second crash was examined by a search and rescue ship and found to be a mass of seaweed and driftwood tangled in the old buoy. Debunked. So the fact that there, you know, was two separate crashes or whatever, the second crash was not actually a crash. It was just miscellaneous parts of the ship and everything caught or not of that ship but uh you know of a ship caught up in seaweed um but the other ship did go down which makes me wonder if the second ship was all caught up in seaweed and crap then maybe that's what pulled down the first one hmm that's a theory so even though i just read a bunch of different reports on how the triangle could be debunked i still a part of me now still believes that there is something mysterious about that spot but what is it what's the big mystery um that's what that's what's so uh 
captivating about this story is there's so many theories and mysteries and no one knows the truth. It's it's just like with UFOs, you guys. Seriously, think about it. It's it's the exact same thing. Do I want to call this an urban legend? I don't know. What defines an urban legend? Mysteries, tall tales, speculation, things that go bump in the night. The Bermuda Triangle has all of that, yes, but... Is it different than Loch Neck Monster, Bigfoot, the Mothman? It's not other than the fact that it's not a cryptoid. <laughs> All right, anyway, so that's going to do it for today's video on the Bermuda Triangle. So let us know down in the comment section, uh, what do you think about the Bermuda Triangle? Do you think that it's real? Or do you think, like, do you think it's an urban legend? Or do you think that it's just all of these theories mixed into one? You know, bad weather, bad communication, the mud volcanoes. What's your theories? We would like to know. Let us know down in the comments section below. And also, stay tuned for more videos like this coming up um, on this channel. Uh, I am going to be doing a podcast coming up very soon that will be a different setup than this right here. Um, the, actually, two are coming in the lineup in July. Um, there's going to be a podcast that is anything paranormal. And then there's going to be, well, I should say there's, it is anything paranormal, but there's different topics that I will be covering. Um, and I'm going to start out doing these podcasts, um, with that, um, once a month, but you'll still be getting these type of videos once a week, uh, if that makes any sense. The second podcast that I will be doing, uh, is a true crime podcast and it's called, uh, a bit more gore. Uh, the other podcast that I was just talking about before, um, the paranormal one is called I'm with Spooky. Uh, and I will have, um, partners talking with me on both of those. So it, it won't just be me. Uh, so it'll be a bit more entertaining. So once again, thank you so much for watching and listening. I greatly appreciate it. And please like and subscribe and share uh, if you would like. Uh, so thank you once again. And remember, stay spooky, my friends.